So next up we've got um, Karen McMahon, who's a lecturer at the University of the West of Scotland in mental health nursing uh, and a registered mental health nurse. Um, she's got experience working with CAMS and particularly with eating disorders, so she's going to be talking to us today about what mental health nurses can offer in regards to eating disorders. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, so I'm going to share my musings of over a career. So uh, you probably guess the answer to the question in my mind is a lot, but I'm hoping to convince you of that by the end of uh, this three quarters of an hour. Can I check first, are there any third year mental health nurse, student nurses still in the room? Excellent, great. Uh, just the audience I want to talk to. Not that I don't want to talk to everyone, but I particularly want to appeal to you. I was listening to your question earlier, and what I would say to you is your opportunity will often come disguised as a challenge. So hold on to that, because when eating disorders first knocked on my door, they came as a challenge, and I wasn't sure they were an opportunity, and it took me a a, a long time to realise what an opportunity they had been. So I'm, I'm going to try and capture some of that. I will digress and I will go off at angles and I'll try to pull myself back again. So there are some things I just want to start with. Uh, I want to start by dispelling some of the myths. You know, eating disorders are sometimes seen as a, a less serious disorder, but sometimes seen as a lifestyle choice because dieting is so much part of our culture, it's become normalised. Most of my experience, I have worked with adults, but the predominant uh, experience I've had is with children and young people. If you're a teenager and you go on a diet, that alone is the highest risk factor for development of an eating disorder which is quite significant when you think of how much diet is part of our culture. So in January, I want you all to watch how many adverts there are about dieting and exercise and think about young people that are vulnerable. We don't need to worry about the young people that aren't vulnerable, it will miss them. But the young people that are vulnerable, it will hit. So what I want you to hold on to is that they are a serious illness. And that dieting is part of our modern culture. It's however not a normal part of life. Eating disorders are just a cry for attention. I'm sure you've heard that term, just attention seeking. So yeah, in some ways they are. People who develop eating disorders are seeking attention because they have a need that needs to be met. And it's certainly not about eating. It's about emotionality, but it's expressed through eating. Families are to blame for eating disorders. It's all about dysfunction in the family. There's absolutely no evidence to support that that's the case. Yes, families become involved in maintaining eating disorders, as we do with any presentation that affects life that has morbidity attached to it. If you're very worried that you're going to lose somebody, then you're going to react in particular ways. And eating disorders only affect white, middle-class females. No, they don't. They affect lots of different groups. They do affect white, middle-class females, but they affect males. They affect people from different social classes. One of the things I want to say is that early intervention does save lives. So if we can get in early enough and catch the eating disorder before it gets a life of its own, then we give people absolutely the best chance. So it is primarily a disorder of adolescent onset. So we should be investing in adolescents. That's not to say we shouldn't be investing in adult, but we should be making sure that we try to catch young people while their personality is still developing. Because if we don't, then the eating disorder becomes their identity. And we talked earlier about the identity of mental health nursing. If a eating disorder becomes your identity as an adult, it's all the harder to change. You get a snowball effect. So neuroprogression happens. The more that you become entrenched in eating disorder habits, the more your brain becomes starved. The more starved your brain becomes, the less able you are to think in different ways. You, you, you lose plasticity. You become rigid in your thinking. It's harder to get through. So we know that we should get in there early. Yet we don't always get in there early. Why do we not get in there early? Well, people with eating disorders generally don't declare them. 
We're embarrassed. We feel that we should hide it. We don't know. We also don't often believe they're ill. The irony with an eating disorder in comparison to any other disorder is the more unwell you become, the less you believe that you're actually unwell. So when I treat children and adolescents, it's someone else that wants them treated. It's not them. They're not coming to me because they believe that I have something to offer them. In fact, they're absolutely terrified of what I have to offer them because they know it involves eating. Because actually you can't help someone to get psychologically well unless you help them to get physically well. But you can't help them to get physically well unless you understand the psychology. You can restore weight without understanding the psychology, but you won't help people to stay well. Now, I'm going to share some of my thoughts around what helps us to get in there and help people to become psychologically as well as physically well. So, it's not denial. It's just that I'm selective about the reality I'm in. So when will you work with a young person who's developed an eating disorder and you think they're in denial, they don't think they're in denial. They think that you're crazy because they've found the answer. Because actually, starvation feels really good. See, if you've been really anxious and worried about stuff and you stop eating, switches it off and you start to feel better. And when you feel better, you think, woohoo, I've found the solution. So young people at the beginning of the eating disorder feel like they are in the driving seat. They know what's happening. They were feeling pretty bad to begin with. And now they're feeling a lot better. So the last thing they want is someone to come along and take it away from them. Now they don't know yet. I know, because I've worked with loads of young people, that an eating disorder doesn't let you stay in the driving seat. It lets you start in the driving seat, and then as time goes on, it relegates you, and it puts you in the passenger seat. Then it's in the driving seat, because that's biology. Because once your brain starts to get starved, your personality starts to change, and it starts to strip anything, everything away from you. So one of the ways that I've understood that, and that's really helped me, is the concept of the uninvited house guest. So I want you all to picture yourself. You're sitting in your nice house or your nice flat and there's a knock at the door. And you open the door and it's a long lost friend. And they say, could I just come in, just come in and visit you? Oh, great, you say. So you have a, a, maybe a nice meal together, you have a chat together. And then they say, actually, would it be okay if I stayed overnight tonight? They say, okay, that's fine. And then the next day they want to stay on. Then two weeks later, this is what you come home to. Your house is destroyed, there's stuff everywhere, your nice clean towels are all over the bathroom floor. And you say, actually, it was lovely to see you when you turned up. However, I'd kind of like to get my life back in order now. Would you leave? And the house guest says, no, I've got, I'm quite comfortable here. I like it here. What you think is chaos? I actually like, I am going nowhere. That's my experience of what an eating disorder does in a young person's life. It comes in and it wreaks chaos and it says, I'm comfortable, I'm going nowhere. So what do you do if you want to help people with an eating disorder then? Well, I think this kind of sums it up. Depending on how you look at that, it's an old woman or it's a young woman. It's the same picture but it's how you look at it. Often what we do when we try to engage with people is we just see the surface level. We don't necessarily see what's going on underneath that. So that brings me to why I think mental health nurses are particularly well placed to think about eating disorders. Because I think mental health nurses are really good at not just going with the surface level not just seeing what people show us on the outside, but thinking about what might that hide? What might lie underneath that? If I wanted to connect with this person, what might I need to do so that our hands, our arms could become intertwined like that? 
So just to digress for a moment, how did I end up in eating disorders? Well, I was sitting in a clinic and psychiatry had left the building. In fact, they'd left the whole service and there was one locum for the whole of the locality that I worked in. But somehow, nobody had told the general population this. The same referrals were still coming through the door. Now, you probably all work with computerised records now, so it's not such a good game. You can't play it in the same way because you can't pass a computer. But there was a great game got up when eating disorder referrals came in. It was called Pass the Case Note. And the case note moved round the room pretty quickly because everybody was scared because eating disorders can fare high risk. You have to be able to think about the physical and the psychological. So I wasn't very good at the game of pass the case note. So we kind of kept ending up on my lap. And I thought I need to be able to do something really good for these young people, but I don't quite know what I'm doing. So I better try and find out what I'm doing. And I found the treatment manual for family-based treatment. And at first I thought it was kind of ridiculous. I thought this is a very complicated and tricky disorder. How could it possibly be distilled into a treatment manual? So I put it on the shelf. And then in desperation one day I lifted it back down off the shelf. And I was very lucky, I had a very good dietetic colleague. And together we thought about how we just might put some of this into practice. And we started to experiment with it. And it actually worked. We were starting to help young people in a different way. Now this is where I was talking to you about opportunity and challenge. Several years later, the author of the manual was coming to Glasgow. I wasn't working in Glasgow at the time, but I was desperate to meet him. Uh, and I was desperate to share with him that I'd actually found his work useful. And I did that really sad thing. If you could picture me now, I sat at the front with my treatment manual because I couldn't wait to get it signed. And I said to him at the end, Professor Locke, would you sign my manual? He said, oh, I got asked all the time. So he did. He signed my manual. And then I went on to develop my interest. And I got supervision from Professor Locke's team. And then I co-trained with him. So he went from right up there to still right up there, but letting me be alongside him. Now, I'm not saying that to you so you go, look, isn't that wonderful what Karen did? I'm saying that so that you can think, whatever passion or interest you have, think about the people that you meet along the way that can help to inspire that and take it forward. So there I was trying to think about how I might reach across the divide. This is why I think mental health nurses are really good at this. I'm here. When you've got an eating disorder, you're in denial. You think you're going to be judged. You're pretty confused. You're really ambivalent. Because a bit of you knows, you know, really it's messing up my life. But a bit of you thinks, not, but it's where I need to be. And I don't know where I'd be without it. Where would I be if somebody took this eating disorder away? So you're really uncertain and you're really fearful. And you're really full of doubt. And you feel really weak. But you look really strong. And things that fuel an eating disorder are all that stuff. Because you can look at someone else and go, look at them. That mere mortal, they need to eat. But I'm so strong. I don't need to do that. But all the time that's making you weaker. So what do mental health nurses offer? Well, acceptance. You can get alongside somebody. Understand where they're at without judging them. Try and understand from their point of view what it's like. So sometimes when I've worked with young people, they've told me back the kind of stuff that mattered to them. And it's not the kind of stuff we might think. It's not really fancy, you know? It's not all the, you know, I really liked it when you did that therapeutic technique. It was so good. One young person said to me, one of the ways you reminded me that I was me is every time we would walk to the medical room, you would say to me, who are you listening to this week? What concerts are you going to go and see? Who are you into? And she said, every time you asked me that question, it just challenged that idea that I was the eating disorder. The other thing we bring is we bring clarity. 
because our brains aren't taken over by the eating disorder. I don't know if any of you have worked with anyone with an eating disorder, but they can really mess with that clarity. You know, and I've had loads of experience, and sometimes I would find myself in a room with someone and they'd convince me that the most wild eating disorder idea was actually a really great idea. And I walk out, ready to share that with their team, and I go, what? What am I thinking about? So when we can step outside of that and have clarity, then we can be curious, and we can play with those ideas, and we can think with people rather than for them. We can give understanding. When you have an eating disorder, you don't think that people are going to understand where you're at. We can hold the hope for a while. Because when you're somewhere, and this isn't just for the young people or the adults with an eating disorder, this is for the families. Anyone seen the film Groundhog Day? Yeah? So if you live in an eating disorder, your life is Groundhog Day. Imagine the thing you're most terrified of in the world. You don't know I'm an expert in it. All you have to do is come up here and I'll expose you six times a day for the next six months to the thing you're terrified of. I promise you'll feel better at the end of it. Nobody's going to be running up to sign up. And young people don't get that choice. They have to do that. They have to eat six times a day regardless of how terrified they are of it. If we can be alongside them and understand that struggle and reflect back to them, that we understand the struggle, then we can help them on their way. Mental health nurses have got strength. They don't give up. They don't just walk away and say, this doesn't look like it's getting better. You know, X number of sessions in and nothing's happening. I'm giving up. No, oh, we, we're grittier than that, aren't we? We've got perseverance. So when we're working with people with eating disorders, we're in it for the long haul. There ain't no quick fix. We have to mend people's brains. We actually physically have to refeed them. Then once we've got through all the physical bit, we have to think about what do we help to put in, that, in its place. We shouldn't strip something away unless we know what we're going to do with it. I've mentioned hope. So this is a real skill that I believe that mental health nurses bring to eating disorders. We hear the stuff that's never said. There's actually not a lot of skill in hearing what's said. It's out there. People have said it. The real skill is in hearing the things that people cannot say. The real skill is in seeing that little healthy bit that's hidden by all the bit that's on the surface and finding ways to communicate and connect with that healthy bit of someone. Because if you can help that healthy bit to grow, then you can help someone to move forward. But then other therapists can do that, can't they? They can find a healthy bit, but they're not nearly as good at us as managing the physical and the psychological. Other therapists are often scared of the physical side of it. I was interested in the debate earlier when we were thinking about how we share skills and you know, whether a generic bit of the course is useful. Whatever way you go round about it, an understanding of the physical parameters is absolutely essential. I've often said to families, there's nothing I can do for a dead teenager. I have to prioritise this bit. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in that bit. I'll get to that bit. But we as mental health nurses have those skills to think both about the physical and the psychological. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. I'm okay. So these are the things that we bring. We bring all of these things. And I'm sure many of you have found that humour in the darkest places is absolutely the best medicine. I'll digress and tell you a little story. Do, do any of you know anything about family-based treatment? No? Oh, great. An audience of uh, people to convert. So part of what we do in family-based treatment is we do a family meal in the second session. And we ask the family to bring in a meal to the clinic. And... Uh, we support the parents to support the young person who definitely doesn't want to eat what they've brought. So one of the families that I, I did this with, the girl ate reasonably well, and then I said to the family, is there anything else you would like her to eat? And they said, the dad said, well, I'd kind of like her to have the cheese that's in the boot of the car. I said, oh, that, that's interesting. Why is the cheese in the boot of the car? He said, well, I was scared to bring it in. 
because I knew that she'd kick off. It's like, fair dues. Have a chat with your wife and see what you'd like to do. Whether you wanted she to stay in the boot of the car or whether you wanted to come into this clinic room. So we had a chat and Dad said, I think I'm nipping out to get the cheese. He didn't say it like that because he was much more politely spoken than me and he was from Spain. But anyway, the essence was that he was going to go and get the cheese. By this time, the girl was spitting nails. So as Dad returned into the clinic, and it was a great bag of cheese, it was a very good selection he brought. So she turned to me and she said, I can't believe this! Why don't you tell him to put all that in a smoothie maker and make me drink it? I went, do you know what? That is a fantastic idea. And the only thing I'm really gutted about right at this moment is that you had it before me. I said, oh my God. So anyway, the cheese was eaten and off she went. And, and she got well in the course and the fullness of time. And as she left my clinic room for the very last session, she laid a letter on my desk on my table and she said to me I want you to read that but I don't want you to read it now fair dues and I did read it and in that letter she told me lots of stuff about therapy that mattered to her that I didn't know had mattered the family watched the DVD of the box set lost all through therapy that's how they coped with her after meal distress and we used to laugh about it and say uh, I can't believe we were lost in the world of anorexia and what helped us through was a DVD box set of Lost. And she said in this letter, I so hated that at the beginning. It so represented my parents taking charge of everything. And she said, and then I realised I was enjoying it. And then I realised it wasn't about the DVD of the box set Lost, it was about a connection that had got lost. And my parents fed me physically, but what they did is they reconnected with me. And then the last line said, you know what, Karen? I think one day I'm going to try that cheese smoothie. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And you know, for those of you setting out in your career, never, ever, ever underestimate the impact of small things that you say and do. She shared that with me. There'll be many, many more people who you have touched and I'll have touched and we'll never ever know. But they'll know, because it's inside them. So when I knew I was doing this presentation, I did go on social media and I did pose the question. I said, I'm going to present to mental health nurses about eating disorders. Guys, tell me what you want them to know. And this is what they said. They said, it's not our fault. It wasn't a choice. So if you meet someone with an eating disorder, don't think they chose it. It got in that driving seat and it pushed them over and it took them over. The most damaging thing is being treated like you're less worthy of care or like you're choosing the illness. As if somehow other illnesses are proper illnesses. Being disorders are about a choice. But compassion is what makes the difference. And that feeling guilty, you feel guilty enough if you've got an eating disorder. You know you've messed the things up and you know that you've messed up life for your family. That's how you think. To have other people confirm that for you is doubly damaging. It stops people getting out of the disorder, trying to lay a guilt trip on them, prevents them from moving forward. What helped? The nurses were aware of my motivating factors. So see when people can't see things. Sometimes you can hold them for them. That doesn't mean you say, if you do this, you can have that. It means you hold it for them. You hold the belief that there's a life beyond the eating disorder. Eating disorders are completely treatable illnesses. If we catch them quickly and give people the proper treatment, there's always life beyond. When there's not life beyond, it's because we've not done a good enough job or we've let it go too long. Very, very few people can't break free of it. When the struggle was too hard, people kept going for them. That's what made the difference. Being able to get up the next day and say, hey, it's a new day. Let's draw a line under yesterday. I know that happened. Beating ourselves up about it isn't going to do any good. Being realistic about what treatments can be offered. What didn't help? 
here, and we don't do eating disorders. I get said in services all the time, that's for the specialists. Well, if you're there and you're there at that moment and you have an understanding of it, there's lots you can do without being a specialist in it. Or you don't look that bad. Eating disorders are not about weight. Actually, people are psychologically at their worst when physically they're at their best weight because they've had to go to a place that they fear. Think of it as going on a journey to a country that you've never visited before. You're in alien territory, you don't know your way around and you don't know the language. But suddenly everybody thinks you're okay because you managed to make it there. That's the time people need you most. What not to say? So if you're in an inpatient unit, don't say, just eat this meal, get it over with. That reinforces the idea there's something wrong with eating the meal. You need to get it over with. Eating's bad. It's something to be frightened about. Or complete this, and then you can go and do other things. You, you can go and run about and do whatever. Oh, so I need to compensate? These are things not to say. Before I stop, I'm going to give the last word to some young people who you may or may not have heard of before. Avril Hart died in her first year at university. She died of anorexia nervosa, having struggled for many years. She fell through the gaps in the transition. It pains me to tell you that the person most worried about Avril was the cleaner in the residences. She watched her each morning when everybody else had left for university, sitting over a tiny bowl of cereal, trying to get the courage to eat some. She would get the spoon so far to her mouth and she couldn't do it and she desperately wanted to stay in university. She was studying her dream course. The cleaner raised the alarm on several occasions. By the time services responded and Avril moved into acute care, she wasn't given the medical care that she required and sadly she died of a heart attack. In the middle, closer to home, I don't know, you know, we had Monica here this morning, Dennis Robertson was the SNP, uh, represented MSP in Parliament, had twin daughters and his daughter died of the consequences of anorexia nervosa. Dennis in Scotland has done us a great service in raising the profile of treatment and raising the profile of specialist intervention being available. The other young girl in the end died of bulimia nervosa. She died four days before she would get, got her GCSE results, which she'd done exceptionally well in. Her, she was normal weight. She looked normal weight. You wouldn't know to look at her if there was anything wrong with her. But she was caught in a binge purge cycle that put too much pressure on her heart. The reason I'm finishing with these young people is to highlight how serious it is. It's completely treatable, but we need to get it right and we need to be able to be in a place to connect with people. If we don't connect with them, we let them down. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Karen. Um, again, we've got about 15 minutes for questions, um, if anyone wants to ask Karen anything. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Thanks for that. Um, really good. Uh, again, as an experienced staff myself, I learned an awful lot from that, so I thank you for that. Okay. Um, one of the things I want to ask is, uh, fortunately, I have nurse individuals here with eating disorders, and I remember touching what we said this morning. Um, Mental health, not a problem, but physical health. Mm. I remember feeling quite vulnerable as a practitioner. How can we uh, ensure that nurses, mental health nurses, working out there in these acute wards are equipped to deal with the physical side of treatment? Yep, and I think in many ways that begins in university. You know, so we should be thinking together in higher education about how we ensure, not just for eating disorders, but for, for all disorders, but actually for people that are out in practice, there are really good guidelines 
out there. So marzipan guidelines, uh, look at what you need to be doing in terms of really sick individuals with eating disorders, with anorexia nervosa in particular. Uh, we should be providing the supervision and support really. Uh, and if, if nurses in the wards aren't feeling suitably equipped to do that, there will be doctors around them who have training and who should be able to support them. So I guess it's about putting that infrastructure in place and providing the emotional support. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Sorry, I don't really have a question at all. I just want to say thank you for being such an inspirational uh, and strong nurse. Thank you. Um, I suppose like we this year, um, the third years at Edinburgh Napier, we've had a session on eating disorders. We've been talking about it a bit. Um, I had a couple of thoughts or questions. Um, the first one was about kind of inpatient versus outpatient care for people with eating disorders, and for you. What do you think is kind of the most therapeutic environment for someone going through that? Perfect. That's an excellent question. Thank you. So there is absolutely no evidence to support inpatient management of eating disorders. None. However, that doesn't mean inpatient management isn't necessary. So you will have people who will need to have periods of time in hospital, particularly around medical stability, also respite perhaps for families but in terms of therapeutic interventions the best place for people to recover is in their own families now one of the things that we haven't got quite right yet and my research is looking at the contribution that fathers make to that treatment is we haven't quite got right i think the support that families need to do that because effectively if we ask a family to support someone at home we're asking them to do the job of a nursing team you know so when we work in the ward we do that we get days off and we finish our shift at a given time families are doing that 24 7 so we need to shore up and think about what support we need and, and certainly fathers have helped me really to think particularly what that's like for men going into a role or organised around caring at home, because it is quite different. Often the social networks are, are quite different. Uh, but yes, certainly inpatient care will be required, and there are some very good specialist inpatient adult eating disorder units now in Scotland, which is a real progression. We don't have specialist eating disorder units for adolescents at this moment in time. Uh, and they do definitely do provide input, but in terms of longer term pro prognosis, community outpatient care is the best. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my other question was about, um, you know, we tend to think of eating disorders as something that mainly or just affects women, which, um, you know, the majority of them are. But I was wondering, clinically, have you seen a rise in um, you know, young men that are having eating disorders, and is there a different approach that we should be taking depending on some of someone's male or female in treatment? Again, another really good question. Uh, we are seeing more men, boys, and men in clinical practice. The jury's out at the moment whether that's actually an increased incidence or whether we've just got better at identifying and uh, that men and boys are feeling more able to come forward. Again, back to the whole debate about men in nursing, and you know, sometimes males with eating disorders would prefer to see a male therapist. We would, but they're not always available. I think the differences in, in boys are that often they start out not particularly wanting to become slim. They start out wanting to build bulk, wanting to look more muscly. So it very much, it can in girls as well, but it very much comes in looking like health. So it's encouraged and, and supported. But in terms of the actual treatment, no real difference between males and females. Okay, Any other questions? Yeah. Just um, having worked in um, perinatal mental health, there's quite a lot of women who are pregnant who have eating disorders. Yep. My experience is that they fall through services because eating disorder services often don't feel they have the skills to work with any women. And perinatal services don't have the experience of working with people eating disorders. So it was just 
really common and to ask you your thoughts and experiences in that area. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's one of the areas where the risk of falling through the gaps is uh, so high. And when you think about that, it kind of blows your brain, doesn't it? Because we've got this new life who's coming in and is going to be shaped by the experiences around them. What more important time to get that right? It's ex the similar time that that comes up is transition between CAMS and into adult. You know, so you have a philosophy of care in CAMS uh, that doesn't sit often in the same way with adult services where people are often seen to need to have motivation to change. Uh, and that falling through the gaps happens in, in a similar way. Uh, I, think we're, I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah.